Good afternoon and welcome to the 20th annual exhibit of hydrogen and fuel cells. We've been here for quite some time talking about fuel cells and batteries, so we're into other issues as well. Um, hydrogen has always been a major part of our um, exhibit here, and uh, we're happy to have one of the specialists in the field, um, an expert on dealing with the issues. Uh, and one of the issues, of course, is where are we going to get the infrastructure for hydrogen? How is hydrogen going to spread and become a normal part of our transportation network? work in other uh, aspects of our life. So I'll be talking to Marcus Bachmar, who's the head of Hydrogen Solutions at the Linda Group, uh, on the subject of moving from demonstrations to infrastructure for hydrogen, all the achievements behind us and all the challenges ahead. Please welcome with me, Marcus Bachmar. Thank you. <laughs> Um, Marcus, can we begin with the general, because uh, we're, we always talk, I mean, we people, the hydrogen community, we think of the fuel cells, and then we think of the hydrogen. Uh, but uh, the Linda Group, they've been thinking about hydrogen for a long time, industrial applications. Could you give us just a sh brief overview of where hydrogen comes into play outside of this industry, where it's been vital to the industry uh, in Germany and in Europe for quite some time in other fields? Yeah, so, so when we start with Linde, some of you may know Linde, some of you may not have heard of Linde. It's an industrial gases company and engineering company. Uh, it was founded uh, 135 years ago. Uh, now, after the time, we are at uh, sales of around 16.5 billion euros, million, billion euros and, and we employ uh, 63,000 people worldwide in over 100 countries. So, um, outside transportation, which is the main focus here, Hydrogen has been used for something like 100 years, again a very long time, has been used in industrial applications. Um, it goes all the way from, uh, from uh, process industries uh, like refineries. Refineries need a lot of hydrogen to desulfurize, uh, to desulfurize the, the, the crude oil. Um, it goes into, into the food, uh, like fa hardening fats. I, d I never knew that before, but hardening fats, uh, there you need hydrogen. Uh, it goes into, into combustion processes like in furnaces, steel furnaces, and so on, and so on. So even hydrogen, uh, which looks like a very simple molecule, is being applied in many, many different areas. But I think today is going to be about transport energy and, and the link between both as well, isn't it? Uh, that is our topic for today, for sure. And again, uh, the transport development, we've had like promises, expectations, uh, we all know that there's one limit to the spread of mobile applications, and that is, is there an infrastructure? But the other defining factor in the equation is, are there um, PEM-powered automobiles or other hydrogen vehicles that actually <coughs> function well enough that there's a payoff um, uh, uh, in order to uh, create the demand for the network? Before we deal with the infrastructure issue, you as a specialist, we've been here for years, I've seen you in many years here. You know that there's been some promises in the past, you know, some optimism about where we would be in 2004 or 2008. So um, have you seen any trend? Uh, is there more realism now? Um, where are these cars? <laughs> so, um, well, first of, a car, first of all, one of the things we don't do is building cars. Um, because it's not a trivial thing. Um, but very honestly, when I, uh, when I joined Linde five years ago, uh, one of the reactions I got from people who I met in politics, in, in administration, um, one of the first reactions was, Marcus, why do you think it's going to happen this time? Because we've heard these promises. And there are people who are, say, 10 years older than I am, uh, who have seen those announcements and, and who have seen those promises that didn't materialize for a number of reasons. Um, Let's not talk about all those reasons why it may not have materialized as, as, as early as ev everybody expected. Um, uh, I think one of the things is everyone is impatient. Everything wants to happen it immediately, but infrastructure, for example, infrastructure buildup does not happen overnight. Even if you had, if, even if you had five billion at hand, you, nobody would be able to build up infrastructure within a couple of months or one or two years. That's, that's one thing. Um, the other thing is, is that credibility of announcements. And I think, and I'm convinced, and I hope that it's, it's, it's really true, um, 
I think when you look at the announcements, when you look at the cars, when you look at, for example, Hyundai having started small series production of, the, of that iX35 fuel cell car in Korea last year, I think it was February 26, 2013, um, I found that a very strong statement. When you look at the investments that go in, when you look at the announcements from Toyota, from Honda, and also from Daimler for the years 2015, 2016, 2017, when you drive these cars, uh, when you drive these cars, I think that's, that's one of the strongest indications. Uh, you don't have cables hanging around. You don't have prototype cars. Um, it's a car that is like the car you can buy in the dealership. Um, the interior is just, is just perfect. Um, th these are the indications where I think, uh, where I think uh, it, it deserves a lot of optimism. Now, now the infrastructure question. Um, there's always been that talk about about chicken and egg and uh, no cars, no infrastructure, no infrastructure, no cars. When it comes to cars, and let's talk about cars, because it's different with buses, it's different with, with forklift trucks. When it comes to cars, um, when it comes to private users of those cars, private owners of those cars, it's very clear that you need a base infrastructure coverage before the first private customer is going to buy one of those cars. And I think that's, that's the tricky part. Because that means, um, when, it, when you look at different countries, for Germany, that would translate, uh, in, and we work with our partners in, 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 in the oil industry and in the car industry, we think for Germany that would be around 140 to 150 stations to get a first coverage where the first early adopters, the first private customers say, this car gives me a similar, a similar amount of freedom to go wherever I want, whenever I want with a hydrogen car. In the UK, we think it's around 70 stations. Um, in California, we think it's around 70, 80, 90, 100 stations, um, and it's similar in other countries. But when you look at those numbers, 80 stations, 100 stations, this is a big investment. Mm -hmm. This is not five demo stations or eight demo stations or 10 demo stations, which you, which you put out there where you get, uh, in most countries where you get uh, a very attractive funding levels if you invest. Uh, because whenever you go into that pre-commercial range of 100 stations, most of the funding authorities say, well, guys, this is not demo anymore, this is not R&D anymore, this is pre-commercial, so we have to lower, the, dem uh, we have to lower the, uh, the funding rates, which we think is okay. But this in turn means that the financial investment, which is okay for a company like ours, for two demo stations, three demo stations, four demo stations, goes up by a factor of 10 immediately or by a factor of 20 immediately when you look at that when you look at that base coverage and that's why we need to work with partners and all those countries we mentioned also japan uh, I, I think the program in japan is very very uh, very very how do you say um, promising um, it's always partners from the car industry uh, from the oil industry and from the from the infrastructure providers who can build stations and who can, and who can provide hydrogen. So that's, in my eyes, that's one of the big challenges for the next step. Uh, you mentioned two things here, and I'd like to sort of focus on the difference. I mean, there are uh, prototype uh, delivery services, forklift trucks, there are small fleets. Uh, but dealing with a fleet is a relatively easy thing uh, in that you have uh, uh, one type of vehicle uh, with one type of uh, refilling technology. Um, and uh, with consumer vehicles, um, uh, it's a different story. Uh, that is, um, have they really decided already on how to build a fueling station? What are the issues in developing an infrastructure? Uh, have they uh, developed standards for refueling? Um, and are the refueling stations themselves uh, a sort of off-the-shelf thing that you can stick on anyone's uh, gas station lot? Um, are there issues involving that? There must be something in this infrastructure issue that poses new problems. What are they? Oh, well, if, again, if you go back 10 years, I think 10 years ago the question was, can you fill uh, a car at, at 70 megapascal? Nobody was so really sure about it yeah, because it's, yeah. it's, it's a pretty high pressure. That has been That's achieved. About 700 bar, is that what Seven, it is? 700 bar dash yeah. 70 megapascal, sorry for that. So um, that has been achieved. Now the next question is really, can you do it economically? And um, can you get, can you get uh, like the size of the stations down? Because uh, again, when you have one of those stations on, on the proving 
on the proving grounds of a car manufacturer, there is typically ample space. So whether it's a 20-foot container or a 40-foot container or two 40-foot containers, yeah, yeah. it does not really make a difference. Exactly. But when you go on public fueling stations, space comes at a premium, especially when you go into, into urban areas. Uh, when you look at the, at the retail prices for real estate um, in, in cities like, let's not even take New York or London which, or Tokyo, which is outrageous, but also in places like Hanover, um, w w if you need, say, 40, 50, 60, or 100, or 120 square meters for the hydrogen station, that makes a big, that makes a big difference on the balance sheet of the, and, and on the P&L of the, of the owner and the operator of the station. Mm -hmm. So getting cost of the stations down is, is, is a big thing, and getting the footprint of the stations down, those are two of our main development targets in our company. Mm -hmm. And with regard to the cost and the footprint, uh, we have shrunk uh, those medium-sized stations from 30-foot from containers uh, to 10-foot, 15-foot containers now mm -hmm. uh, over, the last, over the last four years. Um, cost, again, we have, we have brought down cost per kilogram as well. Um, and uh, we have also now made some major investments into production facilities. Uh, we've built a quite sizable building uh, to start small series production of those fueling stations. Again, in order to get throughput up and to get piece costs down for those stations. Mm -hmm. okay. Just on the uh, issue, though, of uh, fueling standards, I've had discussions on this stage in the past few years about the possible tanks uh, for um, uh, vehicles. Uh, there is still a discussion whether metal hydrides will play a role in storage. It seems to me that things are in flux. Um, and uh, it, cost factors, there's this debate about 700 bar, how many, what's the percentage of energy that you lose uh, pressurizing? I know you have an, a particular opinion yeah. on that, but what are they doing in Japan? Is there someone leading the way in creating standards for these automobiles so that uh, really uh, certification, a single type of refueling station is slowly coming yeah. to form itself? So you can identify that's what it's going to look like, that's how it's going to operate? So um, wh when you talk about the stations, I don't expect standard stations. Because I think we should have different size stations for different throughput, uh, depending on whether you're on, on, on a highway or a motorway, or whether you are somewhere in a downtown area, or whether you are somewhere in, in the countryside. So we need different sizes. I, I would also not want a standard technology, because I think it should be up to the creativity of the different players in that market uh, to develop good solutions, the optimum solutions for the, different, for the different sizes. So I would not limit that to a specific technology. But what is really important is, is the geometry of the nozzle. And I'm very glad that with hydrogen cars we have, I, I think it's been six or seven years since we have uh, ISO standards for the geometry of the nozzle. So you can use the same car and the same nozzle in North America, in Japan, uh, in, in the European countries. This is a tremendous advantage, especially when you look at, at how many years it took battery cars to agree on, on, on the same plug, uh, plug geometry and the same plug uh, dimensions um, within one country, not to speak of Europe, not to speak of the world. The other one is really the filling protocol, which again is, is an ISO protocol, mm -hmm. uh, an SAE protocol, sorry. Um, and again, this means that the filling protocol, how much, how much gas you push into the car tank, at what flow rate, at what temperature, it, again, it's a worldwide standard. And I think these are very, very big advantages. It's, and, uh, and when you look, again, when you look left of the nozzle, I think it should be left to the station manufacturers to develop very high performance, low cost stations. Right of the nozzle, I always say it's up to the car manufacturers to put in the optimum tank. Um, and whether they put in a big tank or a small tank, whether they want to have a large range of the car or a small range of the car, that's really up to the car manufacturers. Things would change if they would go away from that se 700 bar standard, if they would go to metal hydride, the whole station setup would be different. But um, honestly, again, that's up to the car manufacturers. If in 10 years time they say, we have found a metal hydride, which is in terms of cost, in terms of uh, energy density, in terms of of, of size it takes away from the, from the passenger compartment, 
if that's better than 700 bar, we will find solutions to fill those, those metal hydride uh, containers. But I think what is really important and what is one of the big advantages, there are standards already today which mean that every car can fill at every station. I should add, if there's any questions from the audience, I can bring you a microphone. So do feel free to ask, just raise your hand, and uh, uh, the stage is yours. One thing that has always dogged our industry in the development, we market this technology as green technology. People are looking in uh, particularly the urban environments for clean vehicles. Already right now in Berlin, there's ozone alarms and uh, 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 you know bad air days. It's like a bad hair day, but worse. It's the <laughs> entire public sphere is, you know, I don't have these things, but they worry about this in Berlin. And in a number of European capitals, they really do look at England right now. And of course, they have the legislation in um, California, which is an optimal environment for um, leveraging that political decision and launching a technology. But on the other hand, we have always had journalists in the field who love to dump on the hydrogen ideology. And by that I mean you test a vehicle and you show how efficient these cells are and then someone writes up a story where he simply adds how many hundreds of miles a truck drove using diesel fuel to deliver hydrogen to one filling station way out somewhere else uh, to fill up that. So my question is, if you build up an infrastructure, um, where's the hydrogen going to come from? And I suppose my question is a little bit more complicated because you can have on-site production. That is, you can decentralize the way you deliver hydrogen to that filling station. There's all sorts of peak power moments where we could be using electrolysis or other ways. So um, do you have any approach, particularly if you're trying to launch infrastructure in an area that is relatively remote, um, you have sort of, what do you have, a pipeline delivering it? Do you truck it in? Uh, do you look at other options? Are those options viable in terms of cost at all? We do have small electrolysis devices, but what is your take on that? You know, Linda is interested in clean fuels, in clean fuels. So what okay. would be your take on okay. that? Do, do you have time until six? Sorry? Uh, do you have time until six? Because I, it, that yeah. was like ten questions in one it question. It certainly <laughs> is. And these are the most complicated <laughs> questions, which I always seem to manage to raise in the last four minutes. <laughs> Sorry, Marcus. <laughs> do your best. No, no problem. Um, no problem. Um, v v very seriously, um, when you go to different countries, the drivers for hydrogen mobility are different. Um, in Europe, it's very much driven by envi environmental questions. It's driven by the carbon dioxide legislation, uh, which, interesting enough, today just measures tank to wheel. So when you have those 122 grams per kilometer uh, of carbon dioxide, which you see on the, on the brochures of the cars, uh, where you have the horsepower and the top speed and, and the carbon dioxide, uh, it's always tank to wheel. So no matter how you produce the hydrogen, and that's, uh, let me be a bit provocative. No matter how you produce the hydrogen today, if you do that tank to wheel measurement, it's always zero grams of, of carbon dioxide. But of course, at the end of the day, the well to wheel, the well to wheel numbers will be decisive. So um, the, the questions you're asking are impossible to answer. They are impossible to answer. We do not know what people will buy. We know today, for example, at the Clean Energy Partnership in Europe, uh, we have made a commitment that 50% of all the hydrogen that goes into those cars is renewable hydrogen. It's certified renewable hydrogen, either from electrolysis, and you see many of those manufacturers around, or it comes from, from biogas reforming, or it comes from other renewable sources. Um, but the question really is, in the, in the medium term, and getting back to that carbon dioxide question, even if you use hydrogen that comes from a conventional natural gas reforming, uh, you already have a 30, around 30% 30 better carbon dioxide emissions per kilometer than with a good diesel or, or petrol car. And as an engineer, I would say 30% better is a lot. But of course, people are impatient. We talked about being impatient a couple of minutes ago. People are impatient, especially in Germany. If it's not perfect, people don't accept it. But we need to find the right balance uh, between the willingness of people uh, to pay the premium, which, which, will, be, which will be there for, for quite a while for renewable or partly renewable hydrogen over conventional hydrogen. And again, we know in different countries, um, 
the willingness to pay a premium is, is, is very different. For example, H2 Mobility UK has, looked, has made a, a customer survey and the willingness to pay a premium for renewable hydrogen was extremely low. Uh, the government wants high shares of renewable hydrogen, which is understandable. So we'll, we'll have to find a balance here. We'll have to find a balance here because now we're going from demo where we have 50 or 100 or 150 cars in a country um, to hopefully thousands, tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands. And we want ordinary people in these cars. We yeah. want these cars and the fuel to be affordable for ordinary people. So we will find a mix. It will be environmental friendly. But whether it will be 100% environmentally friendly from day one on, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to promise that. It really depends on, on uh, at the end of the day, on, on the end customer's preferences for these different mixes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I suppose we're all working towards a Model T yeah. in the American uh, uh, metaphor or the Volkswagen, uh, a car affordable yeah. and available to everyone um, uh, that you can refuel anywhere. On that path, though, uh, in preparation for this conversation, uh, we talked about uh, California with those special lanes you can drive in. Um, uh, uh, my brother's in Silicon Valley, and if he wants to get to work in less than an hour and a half, there's one special lane for hybrid cars, for electric cars, um, and for hydrogen-fueled uh, cars. That would be uh, an easy thing, and it makes a lifestyle difference. Yep. So there's already that advantage there. You mentioned Japan, where they are really moving forward um, uh, much more quickly, it seems, than many European nations there. What sort of advantages to the hydrogen fuel cell driver are there there? Are there any, or uh, is there a, uh, some cost savings? Is there any benefit to the driver, or is it just something that uh, uh, people tend to buy? Yeah. Um, uh, again, I'm not an expert in car customers, but always you have different segments. You have, you have people who just want to have the latest yeah. in their driveway and who are willing to pay up. Mm -hmm. um, you have people who are penny pinching and really have to really have to watch the cost to run their car, to buy their car, to run their car. Um, you have people who don't care much about technology. You have people who, who, who uh, really look under the hood and want to understand everything that's going on there. Um, I think uh, it, uh, in, in the first couple of years, of course, these cars will be a bit more expensive. So I expect um, affluent people, uh, environmentally oriented people, to go into these cars first. But again, it's the car manufacturers who are the experts on targeting, on targeting these target groups. Mm -hmm. We're running out of time right now, yeah. so I have um, just enough time to thank you very much, uh, Marcus Bachmeier, who's head of Hydrogen Solutions. Uh, and uh, we've been discussing the infrastructure issue. At one point you said, how much time do we have? Can I talk until six? I should remind you that this is a phenomenal educator we have in front of us. If you have any questions, his booth is B77. It's around the corner here. And uh, you seem to enjoy uh, spreading the word and getting into these conversations. I've enjoyed it immensely with you, Marcus. It's been a pleasure having you, and I hope we have you back here next Brian. year. Thanks a lot, Brian. It's been great fun. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Marcus. Hey.